TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. Right behind me, you see it? Little warning screen. Just in case, man, you never know. Don't forget, man, twitch.com is where you can catch any of the live streams if you want to. Usernames at the bottom of the screen. And we also got Patreon.com. You know what it is. <laughs> no, my bad. Um, that's where you can watch series, movies, Premier League highlights with me, man. Stuff that we can't watch on YouTube, man. This is Jimmy the Giant. The brutal evolution of British gang culture. I'm interested. I, his channel is very intriguing to me. Intriguing word of the day. Uh, he got a lot of stuff, man. It's good stuff. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. British gangsters. We love them. I come here for a f***ing shootout, right? That is God. And that are the Peaky Blinders. I have to admit... Peaky Blinders is one of my top favorite shows that you can ever... <laughs> Peaky, Peaky Blinders has got to be one, one or two for me. It's debatable, depending on how I'm feeling. Don't forget, we watch that on Patreon, too. When I finished watching Top Boy, my use of the word bruv increased at least 60%. After Peaky Blinders, I started to look at the flat caps and next. However, today I want to look deeper. And I want to explore the evolution of the British gangster, how it's changed over the years. Nowadays, they're carrying these zombie knives, the machetes, the sword. Don't harm women. Don't harm kids. All that is out of the window. The stereotype. Hey, everybody, EBK now. I don't know if the EBK culture has hit the UK. But it is all man for himself. No morals, no street code, no values, no big homies, no nothing. Of a typical gang member is a gun toting, drugs dealing, African Caribbean high on. That's why I only represent <laughs> growing and developing. <laughs> drugs and rap music. I was about to discover that the truth is very different. <laughs> The London Docks is like the OG spot for British gangs. This is this is kind of like the spawning point. But we move towards the Victorian era, which was 1837 to 1901. In this period, Britain and specifically places like London were massively evolving, right? There's tons of money coming in, which in turn created many more opportunities for crime. And it's mainly because there were so many ships coming into London with loads of different goods. Who's going to notice if a, a crate full of bickies goes missing? And so gradually, these, these sort of gangs, these groups of petty thieves would start to organize and a culture started to form and we can see it in the way they would talk they had their own language cockney slang do you want a thing on the coconut oh pudding yes please he's talking about the peelers you doddy is that to peel the cheese or the coconut the roses now i'll say being what the hell was they just talking about I'm, honestly what 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 was that that's cockney slang that's alarming honestly <laughs> number of little shitboy groups of what you could call gangs none of them really were like famous until we got to the late 1800s the streets are overrun by gangs of young thugs known as scuttlers for over 30 years they terrorize the population with constant outbreaks of brutal street violence the scuttlers started to make a name for themselves in the 1870s as violence between groups of scuttlers would pop off in manchester and it would be with the scuttlers i think where we'd start to see the beginning of like gangster fashion <laughs> They would wear these brass tipped pointed clogs, bell bottom. Cuz is pregnant. <laughs> They would wear these brass tipped pointed clogs, bell bottom trousers cut like sailors. Their hair was always cut short on back and sides and they would have this fringe called a donkey fringe. And on top of that, they'd wear a peak cap tilted to the side to, you know, show off the fringe. When it comes to weapons, they would have knives, but also they had a weird weapon, which was their belt. So they would tie them around the wrist and use it like a, like a fucking abyssal whip on the ops. And as well, they would often have rival gangs. This was kind of the point and they would fight each other. Scuttling might have been ignored had it been contained to just the gangs. 
But when innocent bystanders became targets, public outrage began to grow. That's how it always is. Gangsters really could go under the radar for the community. But as soon as you start involving innocent people, like, it's over with. That's it. It's too much attention on you. At, this, at many points in the 1890s, there were more young people in strange ways held for scuttling than for any other kind of criminal offence. However, the scuttlers wouldn't last forever. You know, it was about 30 years before they started declining. Through an approach, which is very interesting for the fucking late 1890s, but they started to try and offer the kids things to do other than killing each other. One of these initiatives was creating a football team by the name of St. Mark's West Gorton. This football team went on to become none other than Manchester City. Oh. Manchester. Wow. It's still Liverpool to the day I die, but this gives me another respect for Man City low key. They still boring to watch. Don't get me wrong, but coming from the most exciting and only gang to 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 champions is you know what I'm saying it's it's monumental. It's honorable. It's it's what's the word I'm looking for? It's inspirational. The city champions of the land. However, I never knew that, man. See, this is what I like to I like to watch stuff that where I learn things. You know what I'm saying? As time would pass, these gangs would evolve from kids fighting for the sake of it into something more serious, leading us to the Peaky Blinders. Now, this dude is a phenomenal actor. I don't. How many Oscars does he have? I know he got seven for one movie that I still haven't watched because it's three and a half hours. I know he got to have more. Obviously, we were going to talk about the Peaky Blinders. You know them. These are them hat boys. You know, cool, calm, sophisticated. However, the TV show is fictional. It didn't, that isn't what happened in real life, but it was based on a real gang from Birmingham. And this was a group of largely young bros from very working class communities. And you know, they would get their hands dirty with the usual bit of violence, a bit of robbery. However, what's interesting about the Peaky Blinders is we really start to see how crime started to become more organized. You start seeing like illegal gambling. You start seeing protection racketeering, bribery, fraud. And as well, fashion wise, these guys wore their signature outfits and of course they too wore the peaked cap as we know the peaky blinders were successful they held control of many of these sort of illegal industries for about 30 years however as it was proven to be more lucrative to do these sort of dodgy dealings etc other gangs started to sniff around and they started getting some ideas and they would begin to challenge the peaky blinders The Birmingham Boys, led by Billy Kimber, who originally was a Peaky Blinder himself. His gang actually overtook the Peaky Blinders, and by 1920, the Peaky Blinders were no more. Early in the 20th century, one of the Birmingham gangs, known as the Brummagem Hammers. And what happened? I used to watch these people all the time, too. What's Anybody watching, what's the name of this show with the two brothers or the two dudes that... The two brothers, right? Tell me so I can start watching again began to spread from the streets of Birmingham to around the country. And this was all because of one lucrative business, horse racing. Following a law passed in 1845, gambling was now a very heavily regulated industry. It could only happen at the racetracks. They would go up to the bookmakers and say, you all right, mate, you, you know, I can see you've got a lot of money floating about. It'd be a shame if some bad people would come here and take it. And they would, you know, very kindly offer themselves as protection for money. However, this would start to make more gangs. You'd see the Hoxton gang, the Elephant and Castle mob, and you know, sometimes maybe they would kind of extort the bookmakers a little bit. And this led to an incident where one of the groups of Brummies went over to the London East End and started to kind of prey and pick on the Jewish bookies. And that kind of pissed off the Jewish bookies and they turned to Edward Emanuel and he recruited the Sabini gang to offer these Jewish bookmakers some protection. The violence escalated and eventually led to the Epsom Road battle. <laughs> Before we go any further with this video, I want to give a massive shout out to Squarespace. I think that was in the, the Peaky Blinders as well. Give me the giant. Anyway, back to the video. And this is where the attack took place. Yeah, we watched this. I reacted to this. The whole of the road here was littered with bodies. The people in the houses round here were apparently screaming with terror uh, because the Birmingham boys were equipped with guns, with hatchets, 
house bricks, iron bars, knives, and they really went to work. The Brummagems all received sentences between nine months hard labour and three years imprisonment. <laughs> man like Charles Sabini. Now, this is a geezer who breaks away from the mold. He's no longer just a shit boy pickpocket. He started to make a lot of money, gain a lot of power, and in turn, started to have connections with judges, police, and politicians. And it's because he was such a, such a cool dude. You know, had a good vibe. Had nothing to do with the money he was putting in their pocket. And it's in this period, like the 1920s, 1930s, where Sabini's power really rested on the growing rise of anti-Semitism. And so Sabini's men would offer protection, but this would come at a price. You've got a nice army base there, Colonel. Yes. <laughs> hey, y'all gotta start... Hey, what do y'all suggest that I watch? Put it in the comments. We gotta get back to this gangster stuff. Because at the end of the day... <laughs> I like that. You know what I'm saying? Well, you wouldn't want anything to happen to it. <laughs> what? No, what my brother means is it would be a shame if I... Oh, oh sorry, Colonel. Anyway, as I say, in the 30s, this is like Oswald Mosley. This is the rise of fascism in Britain. And he has his own gang called the Black Shirts, who were in part the Billy Boys, which was led by Billy Fullerton, who was a gang that reigned terror all over Glasgow. You fight with your fists? Billy Boys. No, we use hatches, no. I did a whole video on Mosley, so we won't get into that too deep. I'll link it below. But basically, Mosley was trying to do a fascism to Britain. And he too would also show this sort of growing trend of originally underworld crime and gangs starting to influence mainstream society and kind of be embraced. Famously, Lord Rothermere, who owned the Daily Mail, in 1934 run a piece with the headline, Hurrah for the Black Shirts. This is a Lord, like this is the top of British society, accepting some of the darkest criminals in the country. In the Daily Mail been fucking up. <laughs> what is, what is, okay. Response to this growing feud between the fascists and the Jews, a gang called the Jewish Yiddishers would be set up to protect them. And their leader was the famous Jack Spot. My name is Jack Spot, and they used to call me the governor. And all I did was to defend the Jews. Whitechapel, East London. Since the turn of the century, home to thousands of Jewish refugees from Eastern Europe. They were easy prey to local English thugs, but the sons of the refugees did not stand idly by. One of them was Jack Comer, better known as Jack Spot. Jack Spot was the financier of a group called 43 Group. This was a anti-fascist Jewish group that would fight the far right. That group as well was supported by politicians, by Labour MPs. And on top of that, also entertainment giants. You had a guy called Jack Solomon and Bud Flanagan. And all of this tension and all this beef would eventually lead to the Battle of Cable Street, where basically the anti-fascists beat the shit out of the fascist. And it, yeah, this was a crazy, very important moment in British history. And deep behind it was all these gangs and gangsters who were now rubbing shoulders with mainstream society and politicians they were becoming increasingly influential in this time as well it's very important it's crazy it sound like ghost of power important to note that 1920 was when the opium ban happened which created a whole new industry for the gangsters to move into to gain more power more respect and more wealth and with all of that the ability to cultivate PR. What are you going to do now that it's all over? You know what's crazy in the gangster world? Like, nothing's ever new. History is always going to repeat itself. It's never not going to repeat itself in, in the world of a gangster. You're never going to do something new. You're never going to do something outside of the box. You're, that's, you're, not, you're always going to repeat the past and you're always going to get killed or end up in jail for life. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Unless you have a plan, an exit plan, and you can get there without pissing people off, the ops off, which is crazily not going to happen, probably. I like to have a bit of family life now, you know. I intend to get married in the near future. Well, I did before this case, but it's put back over the case, and um, I should get married as soon as possible, you know. Post World War II, something happened to the British gangs. They started to become like celebrities. You would have the firm based in Bethnal Green, led by none other 
than the Cray twins. The Crays had control over 14 square miles of London. They owned pubs, casinos, bars, all of the businesses would be paying for their protection. And they were like any other gang, you know, they're involved in the usual, the murder, the bribery, the robbery, the arson, the gun crime, protection racketeering, illegal gambling, assault. But you know, that's your bread and butter, that's your basics for a gangster. But what really made the Crays very, very different was how in the 1960s they gained celebrity status. Instead of the way that the old gangsters were hiding in the shadows so, you know, they don't go to jail, the Crays owned all these popular nightclubs and they'd invite celebrities, very famous people. They would do professional photo shoots, television interviews, all whilst having control over London's criminal underworld. And yeah, man, they was too much in the spotlight. Way too much. In Y'all ever seen American Gangster with Denzel Washington? Uh, this is based on a true story, obviously, but the point that being a gangster, you have to stay under the radar as much as possible. When you want that limelight, people get to watching you. They wonder where your empire came from. The tax man coming for you. Normally, if you don't die or you don't go to jail from a, 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 a crazy assault or M charge, them taxes going to get you. So stay out the limelights. <laughs> As much as possible. As soon as Frank Lucas put on that fur at the at at, the, at that boxing match, who was on them? The police. Who is this? Who is this? How can he afford a ringside ticket? And how can he afford a thirty thousand dollar fur? It was over with. <laughs> You're done. You're on the radar, buddy. On top of it, the Crays were beloved. Like people loved them, and it's because they were perceived to be like Robin Hood's. One of their closest friends was mourning Ronnie's death. Because they were good guys. They were good gangsters, if you want to use such a word. They wouldn't harm women or children. They were untouchable. If people want to talk about the victims, like Jack McVitie or George Cornell and that, they were hardened criminals the same as him. They would have done to Ronnie and Reggie what they'd done to them, and that must always be remembered. The craze, at least publicly, made a, a very concerted effort to portray themselves as having a kind of code of conduct. They wouldn't hurt innocents, women or children. And this careful image cultivation worked. And you can see that if you look at their bloody funerals. Root took the procession along streets the Cray twins used to rule with their own brand of terror and protection rackets back in the early 60s. However, we have to ask some questions. How real was this image that they had cultivated? Others, though, were under no illusions. For the policemen who finally caught the craze, they were far from glamorous heroes. There's no question about what prevented witnesses giving evidence to suggest that the craze are involved, and that was terror. Just absolute fear and terror. I think they're an extraordinarily murderous, effective pair of gangsters. I think there's been covered up, I say, with a lot of schmaltz, a lot of silly sentimental twaddle, but uh, they were very, very good at their job. Uh, if they hadn't started killing people, they probably would have been in the House of Lords by now. A geezer by the name of Tony Lambrianu, I don't know, he was a former member of the firm, and he sweared by the fact that this image that the craze created was a complete myth. Now, this idea of, like, a myth is very interesting because it leads us to the gentleman gangster. It was a mixture of fear and respect. Respect because women and... I always thought being a gentleman and a gangster was... They go hand in hand because you get the respect of the community, but you still get the fear from your ops. You know what I'm saying? When people get to taking that humble demeanor for, for this is a real thing. There's people out here like this. And children, untouchable. Ordinary guys who went to work and they're untouchable. Any rouse we had, it's only amongst ourselves. And if we are or kill one another, so what? To this day, there is a very common belief that gangsters of the past were gentlemen. Like, sort of, they were kind of good people. We, and we'd see this particularly through films like The Godfather, who would sort of romanticise the mafia, who, you know, do very bad things to innocent people. And it claimed that they had a kind of code of conduct and this mythology does a lot of heavy lifting for the gang but they do within the gang they do have a code of conduct the mafia does 100 percent. they have a hierarchy they have ways to move up they have codes they have a lot of stuff 
gangsters of the past to kind of act this mythology there's a lot of heavy lifting for the gangsters of the past to kind of act as though they were somehow much less brutal and much less awful than the gangsters of today however the reality of this is very debated the craze carried out many awful murders I'm glad they're six foot under and the best place they can be. Yeah. They were two horrible bastards. You don't hurt your own, you don't, but they hurt anybody then. They were really frightening if you really knew them. People who say they're lovely boys didn't know them. They were bloody animals. That's I the, thought they should be ironed out, to be honest. You thought the crazy should yeah, shot? Yeah, the two of them. They extorted innocent businessmen into paying protection, and if they didn't, they would assault them. Disposing of bodies was very easy back then, and they did it a lot, so we'll never know the full scope of how many innocent people they may or may not have killed, or people below them might have killed. But in the proven murders that they carried out, they were absolutely brutal, and often done just for fun or a show of power. As well, when it comes to women, like the, the psychological abuse of Reggie Cray's wife called Frances led her to taking her own life while some people speculate that actually they might have murdered her you know but despite all of that somehow the pair have enjoyed this sort of image of being gentlemen gangsters at st matthew's church a huge cry went up as reggie appeared greeted more like a film star than a criminal and so have most of that era the the uh, their rivals called the richardson gang who also were known as the torture gang. It's alleged that when they would torture people, they would pull out their teeth, cut their toes off, and nail victims to the floor. You know, gentleman stuff. And when the car arrived, I kidnapped him, slammed him in the car, took him to our one-armed bandits, silenced machines, and done it with an axe. Really done it. And on one occasion, he put his hands over his head and the axe went right through his fingers and nailed his hands to his head. And we have to massively bear in mind that the police and the judges were often bribed by these gangs. And so then you wonder, why did they turn to gangsters for protection and not the police? Probably because the police didn't do their job in the slums of Britain. People in this era didn't trust the police at all. Probably worse. Oh, they probably would never report most of the crimes, most of the murders that might have happened to innocent people, women and children. So I would not be surprised that in the shadows of history, there are some very dark stories that we'll never know about. Nowadays, I mean, it's, uh, it's all on film, these cameras, videos from the cameras there. I mean, in them days, you were lucky to find a phone box that worked. Now look, I talk about this because it's important, right? It's important when we now think about modern gangs. Have a look at this. I'm now brandishing in front of you a 21 inch brutal looking black knife. It is sharp, believe you it's me. It's terrifying. It is terrifying. It is ter Old school mafia, don't harm women, don't harm kids. All that is out of the window. Whoever terrorizes the other postcode the most will dominate the drug market. But the real problem is actually much bigger than that. The animals have taken over the zoo. These are gangs that we see today and we have much more visibility of. Due to better reporting of crimes, better policing, technology, surveillance, camera, the romantic image of old gangsters is very likely because they didn't have this sort of same visibility. However, as good as it is that we now report and we can record and see what is going on, it has a negative effect of a, a perceived increase in crime and brutality amongst gangs. So a lot of the research I did when you look at scholars like Andrew Davies, who writes books uh, about the history of gang crime in Glasgow and Manchester, or Robert McKilvey, who's got volumes of stuff about the history of gang crime in Liverpool. What you see firstly is that this is not a new problem. Every generation pretends gang crime is a new problem. So when you look at the press reports they cite in their scholarship, it's this same sort of sense of moral panic, this unprecedented thing. Well, actually we've had violent uh, teenage youth gangs for 150, 200 years, maybe even longer. Like, I'm not kidding you. Go to a pub and talk to an old geezer about gangsters of today versus the past. He'll probably tell you that they didn't even use knives. They just, they settled everything with their fists and, I don't know, fucking slam poetry sessions. Or... And this image is often romanticized through television and films. And it has a massive... Yeah, that's cap. Old school gangsters are... They are very ruthless, though. They're ruthless impact on how we look at modern gang culture.
My most dangerous assignment was to uncover the hidden world of organised football violence. England has the worst record of football violence in Europe and it's on the increase. So from the 70s onwards, we'd have some different waves of types of gangs. We'd have the football hooligan gangs. I've made a video on that. But many who swear they ain't gangs. <laughs> Boy, y'all gang members. Y'all got together whenever it was a game time. It doesn't matter. Or uh, And y'all went and terrorized stuff. Your ops was the opposing team's fan base. Y'all gangs. Y'all cannot convince me otherwise, ever. So uh, we can argue about it in the comments if you'd like. Let's make a comment. I'll argue with you. Many of those went from fighting on football terraces to doing very bad crimes. You had the Chelsea headhunters, known for armed robbery, armed smuggling, drug trafficking, neo-Nazi shit. Jesus, look at this list of crime. My God. You'd have British triad gangs, such as Big Circle Gang, 14K, and some other names that I'm going to butcher if I try and pronounce. And these guys were known for drug smuggling, extortion, and also human trafficking. Mr. Yao, or should I say Georgie Pai? My name's Roger Cook from Central Television, and I'd very much like to talk to you about your activities as a, as a triad, as perhaps Britain's senior triad. From the 70s and 80s in Brixton, you have gangs like the Black Panther Militia, the 28s. A lot of these were referred to as Yardy gangs. But you see, throughout the 90s and into the 2000s, society became more and more aware of these black gangs. Particularly in the 2000s as black culture started to be seen more through music, television and film. And so the media just shifted gears to really only focusing on these black gangs. In districts like Hackney, more than half the black boys grow up without a father. They perform poorly in schools and do not really have good prospects on the job market. For many of them, the only way to make money is through pushing drugs and joining a gang. When it comes to gangs, race is really interesting to talk about because it's very important. Lots of gangs historically have formed through these kind of racial groups. And so from my research, it seems that in this same period of time, like the 90s, there would actually be a growing rise of Asian gangs, Pakistani gangs. So whilst in the UK, we were relatively aware of Southeast Asian gangs in the 90s, like the triad gangs. However, for all of the talk these days that we hear about Asian gangs, Pakistani gangs, Muslim gangs, reporting of the history of these gangs, like in the 80s, 80s and 90s is kind of difficult. I couldn't find a lot. From what I could find, there was a gang called the Lynx Gang, Holy Smokes and Tooty Nunks. These were mainly established in South Hall from about the 60s onwards in response to racist attacks they were getting from the National Front. However, as that threat from the National Front decreased, the gangs became a problem themselves as they started to extort their local community and deal drugs, etc. And it's interesting to me how little I could find about this thing that had been going on since the 60s. And it really, again, begs this same question writing down some of these names so I can go back and try to find documentaries on them of how we only tend to become aware of a thing that may already be happening when the media starts reporting of it more. And as we become more and more aware, these things become better documented and we feel like we see them more. Brigadier Billy Wright did what he had to do to ensure that our faith and culture was kept intact. Yeah! I think about it, how often do you hear about Irish gangs now? During the Troubles, which was like the 60s to sort of late 90s, Irish criminal gangs, particularly with links to the IRA, would receive tons of media coverage. You'd have the UDA, the UVF, who were involved in, you know, all the usual gang type activities, who were also very highlighted for how brutal they were. Things like kneecapping, tarring and feathering, where they would pour hot tar on their victim, cover them in feathers and make them walk down the street. And many of the victims... Wouldn't you think? These crimes were women who were being accused of having relationships with British soldiers. And of course, there was also the terrorism. They were literally bombing civilians. They also had a group called the Shank Hill Butchers, who were known to abduct and kill random innocent Catholics. And you know, sometimes a few Protestants if they made a mistake and thought they were Catholic. And so I say all this because of the amount of intrigue and fascination we have about gangs and gang culture, the media seems to only focus on certain types of gangs, typically certain ethnicities, as and when they're relevant to the sort of political discourse of the era. But first, Muslim- 100%. And then they talk about it in they, they votes. I mean, they talk about it in a um, campaign to get reelected and then they, 
then it ends. Things have won the vicious power struggle between British prison gangs, according to the hero of the London Bridge terror attack. And also the Irish gangs that we really, really cared about in the 80s and 90s. You never hear about them in media, even though they are organised in some of the highest levels of criminality. The Kinnahans have grown from a local Dublin gang into Ireland's most powerful internationally recognised criminal organisation. We've done several documentaries on them. So as of today, the Kinahan Transnational Criminal Organization joins the ranks of Italy's Camorra, Mexico's Los Zetas, Japan's Yakuza, and Russia's Thieves-in-Law. Those people who analyze it as a race problem. Yeah. These are black gangs, these are Asian what? gangs, these are... This is, this is fascinating. I mean, let's just look at the maths. There are 1.2 million black people in London. In a bad year, 50 of them will kill someone. That's less than 0.004% of the black population. Just to contrast, in a bad year in Glasgow, say 2005, there were 40 murders. There were only 600,000 people in Glasgow. So that year, a Glaswegian as a whole was twice as likely to be killed as a black Londoner. Whereas the commonalities, when you actually look at the demography of violent crime, the commonalities remain the same in Glasgow, Liverpool, Belfast, Naples, or London. Racial explanations are sort of a sort of way out for, for the powers that be, a way out for the wider society. Um, and it's revealing that what happens in London is black on black crime. Okay, what happens well, in Glasgow, race is not important, or Liverpool, race is not so important. So let's look. I think from the 2000s onwards, our perception of gangs probably did change a bit. And I think a lot of it's through TV shows and films. Stuff like adulthood, kidulthood, Top Boy, a growing focus on the modern black gangs in London, along with the rise of grime music, but then more particularly drill music later on, which really over glamorizes gang culture. You'd have people like the Peckham Boys, Marley Boys. There's literally just so many London postcode gangs. I can't really list all of them. There are YouTube channels that delve into all of the different beefs between them and all the different gang wars. Even like drill groups would be gangs and they would have these wars in the streets and then rap about them in the music and the sort of london black gang has changed the fashion as well now like we'd call it a road man they sort of wear black puffer jackets balaclavas night air max all this kind of look and i think when we talk about all these films and musicians etc it's, it's sort of created like a victim of its own success where now that is what people think of when they say about gangs they think of black gangs and this perception can create a massive problem when it comes to actually trying to solve gang culture there's a report here from the csj and they say gang culture is often referred to as a black problem evidence shows that this is not the case overall ethnicity of gang members tends to reflect the ethnicity of the population they live hence why even Easter House Estate in Glasgow are predominantly white gangs and gangs from Brixton are predominantly black. The higher proportion of black gang members reflects the disproportionate amount of black communities living in deprived inner city neighborhoods. Also, on top of the whole racial thing, it, it gives us a very London centric view of gang culture, which again can be unhelpful. If we look at statistics for where is what town is like the most criminal? Cleveland in Merseyside ranks number one for most dangerous place to live in the UK. Not London. We're in Middlesbrough, the biggest town right in the heart of Cleveland and the UK's epicenter for criminal activity. New statistics show the rate of recorded crime across Cleveland police stands at 141.7 per thousand people. To put that into context, that's nearly 40% higher than London's Metropolitan Police and over 50% above the rate for England and Wales. The area has the highest rate of... Make sure I write that down. I heard a lot about Cleveland, though. Anything with the name Cleveland is going to be rough. ...sexual offences in the country, the second highest rates of knife crime, and the fourth worst rates for drug offences. And the highest murder rate by police force area. But you know, we always talk about London, but when do you hear about Cleveland? And is it not kind of interesting that Cleveland happens to be 92% white, so it doesn't really play into this perception and perhaps doesn't get as much coverage? When the media and the police put out pictures of the sort of night. This is the thing that I be talking about, man. This, I'm gonna bring it back here, man. This, this is what I be talking about when I be talking about racism has to have a <laughs> it has to have a big push behind it. This is systemic racism. Whether you want to believe it or not, the media is so big that they can cover up and make it look small when they, or not even there when they, when they don't want it to be. But when they want to point something out, oh, they're going to make it happen. They're going to make it happen. It's tough, man. Somebody in a comment asked me to explain something, and I'm not explaining nothing. I said what I said. That's it.
Take it how you want to. That they are actually taking in because some young people, it, it kind of so glorified them thinking, well, they need to step up their game. Back in the days, it, when you, you had a gang of maybe up to 10 people, maybe one or two might be carrying a weapon. Nowadays, they're carrying the zombie knife, the machetes, the sword. And I say all that to give us perspective, right? It's, it's not to say that gangs aren't awful and brutal today. They definitely are. But to sort of pretend that this is a new phenomenon and it hadn't existed in past is just unhelpful. However, I think it is fair to say that gangs probably do escalate violence over time. One of the evolutions of modern gangs uh, is a new crime called County Lines, where drug dealing from London is spread out through networks into more rural communities. This is bringing drugs and crime, stabbings, etc. into more rural areas of England. So whereas gangs were very much isolated and localised to London, Manchester, Liverpool, Glasgow, now they're starting to be seen in more rural communities where previously these were like peaceful middle-class neighbourhoods. This in turn is more newsworthy and increases the reporting on these activities. So this is a clear evolution showing that gang culture is spreading and moving around areas that previously it didn't. And, and look, it's not far-fetched to say that gangs do escalate violence. Like gang wars, beefs get passed down. And if Bro. Who do you think he is? Who pulled out a whole samurai sword? A subcompact sam samurai sword is tough. If one side is doing more brutal means, then probably you're going to adopt that. So yeah, you can escalate gang brutality over generations. However, I do think this romantic image of gangsters of the past is really just a sort of nostalgia and a common trope that every generation has where they think that the youth are now worse than they were before. And the problem with this kind of rhetoric, this kind of way of thinking about gangs, as it hinders our ability to understand and empathize and ultimately solve the root causes of why people are drawn into gangs in the first place. The police comes of being shot in the leg, you know. Have you stabbed someone before? Yeah. That's really disturbing because to I, see I, that. I, I'm disturbed, mate. <laughs> we're all disturbed, you know, because we're all, we're all the same. What documentary is this? I've really never seen this one. We all grow up through the same shit and no one breaks the cycle, it's hard around here, the cycle never breaks. And the social indicators of that violence have remained identical for almost 200 years. And those got a cleaver. Social, social indicators are uh, poverty, domestic abuse, lack of education, so expulsion from school. So for example, almost half the people in prison today in Britain were expelled from school as children, versus just 1% in the population as a whole. Among young people, about half the young people in young offenders institutes were at some point in care growing up, versus about 1% in the population as a whole. So you still need to get to the root causes of the reason. But that takes money problem. and commitment. That means prioritizing this end of crime. And it means believing that the young people who are dying are important and valuable. And Which they say they do, but their actions don't reciprocate that. Will it being willing to have a nuanced and human view of young people that do sometimes very, very bad things. The thing is, it'd be like, oh, the youth is the future, the youth is so important. That's true. All of them, though. All of the youth. They're all important. The reason that people join pick and choose gangs is very well understood. Don't say, don't, oh, well, it's easier to support these, these, these type of youth than it is the, no, 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 they're all important now. There's lots of research into this. The, the obvious things like poverty, deprivation, bad schooling, bad education, breakdowns in family units, breakdowns in systems, lead people who are at the very bottom of society to to feel a bit lost. Gangs, in a sad way, offer a identity and a family unit. And 100% facts. Oh, he cooking. <laughs> also an opportunity to make money and make something of yourself. Instead of spending £6.8 billion a year on our overcrowded prisons, I think we could probably redirect some of, you know, that money into solving the economic problems that leads people to join these. Yeah, no, not in America, at least. Prison is a business. You can trade. You're like, no, no, no. I ain't doing that. It's too big of a biggest, I mean, biggest. It's too big of an industry to relocate, reallocate money from.
gangs in the first place. Would you ever worry about the actual how serious it sometimes no, can all, get? All we basically worry about is who be starving this weekend. What do you guys keep fighting if it's so dangerous? Trade. Go on. Trade. Trade. Sorry, don't hang your pansy. Do what we got to do. Go on the street wall. What else we got to do? Don't hang your pansy. Bro said, I love my glasses. I be shooting sh from deep. My bad. Do what we got to do. Go on the street wall. What else we got to do? They ain't giving nothing for us. They ain't got nothing for us to do. Be Nowadays, someone getting stabbed over nothing is nothing, man. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, jump on the dip. I'm already subbed up, man. I love this, man, content. I ain't even gonna lie. This is some of the best content I didn't watch recently. Am I subbed? Yeah. Post notification bells on and everything. TLO, leave a like, comment. I'm gone.